Thank you and good morning. Um, I'm with Key Information Systems. We're a local systems integrator and uh, I spent 31 years with IBM uh, uh, before I joined Key Information Systems and we did like the, HEP, the EPIC uh, Care Connect implementation at UCLA Health and a number of other hospitals around. So we're delighted to be a sponsor and I'm particularly delighted to uh, to introduce our, our keynote speaker today, uh, given the fact that I spent so many years at IBM, it's, 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 it's a pleasure. And this lady is, uh, as you saw on the agenda, Chief Nurf Nursing Officer at, uh, at, at uh, IBM Health, and it's a, obviously a massively global organization. And as you would suspect, to be the Chief Nursing Officer, you would have to start your career as a nurse, which she did for nine years in uh, Milwaukee. Uh, and obviously enjoyed technology, so she moved over to Aurora Healthcare, uh, which, is, which is quite an interesting organization. 15 hospitals, 120 uh, ambulatory centers, 30,000 employees, so fairly large. And she literally had a career at Aurora uh, and moved into Director of uh, Clinical Application Development and then moved on and became the vice president of EHR, Electronic Health Records at Aurora, um, and uh, really an early adopter of all the technology, which is, which is wonderful to see. And with all that experience, uh, Washington came calling, and uh, sure enough, she became the deputy national coordinator for programs and policy at the ONC, which is the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT uh, in Washington, D.C and also did another job at the CNO with the quality and safety, so I held numerous positions there uh, before uh, popping over uh, to IBM. And um, Healthcare Magazine says she's one of the 20 people that made a massive difference in healthcare, uh, so that's great to know, and she's really, truly a pioneer in, uh, in this industry and what she's done for everybody, so with, it's my great pleasure to announce uh, the Chief Nursing Officer for IBM Global Healthcare, Judy Murphy. Judy, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Well, hello. Um, so yeah, when I, when I hear my, my uh, bio, all I think about is endurance. I think that's what it takes to be a pioneer, is to just stick with it. Um, but I'm really excited uh, to be here, especially because otherwise I would be in the snow in uh, Washington, D.C. <laughs> I was supposed to come in yesterday, and uh, knowing that the storms were coming, I uh, was in Vegas, you know, favorite place, not really, um, on Friday. So I just stayed there and then came straight from there. So luckily, I was uh, able to get in. Um, okay, what we're going to talk about uh, is the evolving healthcare landscape, and that's not going to be a surprise to you. I'm going to go relatively quickly, um, but really what's changing and, and why is it important that we, um, those of us who work in IT, um, uh, need to change too. And just quickly, how many people are clinicians in the audience, doctors, nurses, or pharmacists, or dietitians? A few. Okay. Everybody else pretty much IT? I know we have a couple of industrial engineers. Uh, IT people? Yeah? Okay. Um, just that, help me give my, my framing as I go through the, the talk. Um, we're going to talk about population health management. Of course, that was the title of, of the talk and why I think that's really the organizing framework, actually, as we go forward for just about everything that uh, we need to do. Um, and some of the tools that we're going to use when we talk about um, population health management. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'll, I'll pause here to say sometimes pe people think population health management is about measuring. You know, like we do analytics, we do reports, and therefore we know what's going on in the population. Well, I'm here to say, yeah, okay, that's about the population health measurement part of it, but the management part of it is actually taking the intelligence that you're getting from the reporting and the analytics and doing something about it, changing the health and the health care of the individuals that, that you're actually measuring. So that's really going to be the thrust of, of what I'm going to talk about. And that'll get us into talking about mobile, the use of mobile, and why that's going to be a really important tool as we think about population health management. Um, talking about patient engagement, again, another very important, I won't call it a tool, but a philosophy and a way of approaching um, the things that we need to be thinking about and how we approach our, um, our patients and think about patient care um, because it's outside the walls of the hospital now and um, you know that 
person with high blood pressure, it isn't about the blood pressure that one time that they're in the doctor's office, but rather it's about all of the blood pressures that that individual is actually um, taking. Um, I'll pause there because <laughs> just about a year ago, my, my husband actually has hypertension, and um, I, I'll, I so vividly remember this because it was really a turning point for me in thinking about this. You know, he said to me, oh my God, I gotta start watching my, my salt intake because I'm going to the doctor next week and I want my blood pressure to be down. You know, and so that exemplifies what many of us have thought about healthcare, right? It's like outside of us. It's like the doctor's problem, you know. Um, worrying about your weight before you go into the doctor's office, worrying about your high blood pressure, whatever it might be. Um, and I kind of looked at him and I thought, yeah, no, not at all. That's not what it's about. It's about us thinking about how, how we own that um, health condition, if you will, and how we are gonna be the key person to make a difference. Um, and so that's the patient engagement part, actually taking ownership and being a true partner in your care. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what's happening as the patient engagement is starting, and by the way, I continue to use the term patient engagement. Um, I do not mean to infer by using the word patient that I'm only talking about people who are in our acute care facilities or our uh, long-term care facilities or receiving home health care. I'm talking about everybody. Um, when I talk outside the United States, I often can use the term citizen um, because oftentimes healthcare is actually provided um, by the government and so talking about citizens works. Here in the United States when I say that it seems like it isn't right um, and I could say individuals so maybe I'll start trying to use that but when I say the word patient I am talking about all of us and how we think about our health and how we um, get our health care all the time. Um, so anyway, what's happening with this patient engagement idea is that now we're actually starting to get consumer oriented. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about how that's shifting to the idea that healthcare is going to be administered and received and thought about the same way we do other retail-like activities. And so because of uh, some of the changes that are occurring, things like high deductible plans, increasing our own personal participation in our out-of-pocket um, expenses, we're starting to pay a little bit more attention to what things cost. So if your doc says that you need to have a colonoscopy, okay, that's like the world's worst thing, but if you have to have one and there's three different places that you can go, you might wanna compare the costs, right? And so what's starting to happen is we're starting to see cost transparency. We're starting to see people advertising their quality scores. We're seeing people advertising their patient satisfaction scores. So this is that consumerism behavior. So we're starting to actually think about and realize we are the consumers of healthcare and therefore we're starting to exhibit some of those kinds of behaviors. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, uh, quick care is a really good example of that. And, how many people have been to a quick care in the last year? Okay, maybe there's not that many of them here. Um, usually, about half the room raises their hand. And why do people go to quick cares for those that do? Convenience, right? It's a normal thing. I park in a normal parking lot. I walk into a Target, a Walmart, um, a CVS, a Walgreens, and I consume health care, and I walk back out. It's a normal activity. I'm not going to a place where I don't know, where, well, kind of like this morning, where I don't know where I'm going to park. I don't know where the building is. <laughs> Everybody have a good time getting here this morning? Yeah. Well, that's like the health care experience, right? Because you're walking into a building, and you have no idea where you're going to register, where you're going to wait, how long you're going to wait, where they're all going to send you. Um, you know, it's kind of a foreign experience as compared to a a normal experience that many of us um, think about when we think about being consumers. Okay, then we'll kind of close with talking a little bit about analytics and um, cognitive computing and, and Watson because no IBM talk would be, um, you know, we, we just have to talk about Watson. It's such an exciting, exciting um, future for us in healthcare. Um, so I think I have, what, until noon to finish? Actually, for the first time, I actually got to start early. I mean, I wasn't supposed to start till 9.15. So this is really exciting. Usually, you know, you're running and you 
start late. So I'm excited about that. We've got some videos um, that I'm going to embed in here, and, and that should um, help kind of break it up a little bit first thing this morning. Um, okay, so on to this, what's all happening in healthcare? You know, um, lots of change, lots of change, um, driven by fundamental shifts in expectations and, and critical drivers. So similar to what I said as I was going through the topics, you know, we've got changing expectations. We do have some critical research uh, resource shortages, increased competition, changing demographics, globalization of healthcare, you know, medical tourism, lots of things are, are changing. And that's really causing us to go from what I refer to as old healthcare and moving toward what, what could be referred to as, as new healthcare. So again, away from the things on the left and toward the things on the right. Away from fee for service toward pay for performance. Away from volume toward value. Um, it's predicted that by the end of this year, 20% of our payments from the federal government for Medicare and Medicaid will be value-based payments, 20%. And the Department of Health and Human Services has gone on record saying that by the end of 2018, it will be 50%. So the train has left the station. Um, lots of different programs trying to vet out exactly what those value-based payments are going to look like. Um, but I think for, suffice it to say that the traditional uh, pay-as-you-go, uh, everything that happens to you, you, you pay for, um, is not going to be the case. Um, things like uh, looking at pharmacy costs, looking at radiology costs, looking at lab costs, um, and do we need to do all the tests and things that we do are going to really, um, I think, be, be looked at. Uh, away from thinking about delivery quality outcome, employer-centric to consumer-centric. You know, we used to think that the center of the universe was the acute care facility, right? And that started changing probably five years ago, where we started to think about the center of the universe is no longer our health care facilities, it's actually our patients and our families. They sit at the center of everything, and health care needs to go around them. Um, a good example of that these days that lots of folks are talking about, especially those who run long-term care facilities, is that there's an increased interest in aging in place. Basically meaning, you know, keeping the elderly in either their homes or in their families' homes or in apartments as compared to uh, in long-term care facilities. And actually, um, the volume of elderly that are in long-term care facilities has been going down the last couple of years. So that's certainly something really interesting to watch. Um, being from IBM again, one interesting thing that, that we're engaged with uh, is a partnership with Apple in uh, Japan. And we're helping, see, so in, in Japan, the culture always was that the, the parents um, or the elderly stayed with the family and the family cared for them. But there's been a migration away from that over the last 20 years. And much more like the United States, the elderly have been living uh, more independently, um, separately from their family. And as the government started to see that happening, um, they realized that they needed to do some support for the elderly in the community. So there's a project that got spawned as part of an IBM-Apple partnership um, using iPads for this aging in place. And it's called the Japan Post project. And I, I bring that up to you because it'll be something interesting to, to watch. Um, basically, they're repurposing their postal workers to not just deliver mail, but to also do touch points with the elderly in the community. And one of the things they're helping them with is get oriented to an iPad set of applications um, that the elderly are using, not just for monitoring things like health conditions, but also for ordering groceries or to do some um, uh, interaction with their family through the, the video on the um, iPad. So lots, in fact, there's six different projects like that around the country um, using repurposed postal workers, again, not to deliver health care, but to do touch points with the, with the elderly and make sure that things are going smooth in their home. Um, one of the biggest things with, with elderly is the sort of confusion and isolation that they get. So these will be interesting projects to watch, but again, another example of, you know, thinking about where we're actually going to be providing care and where health and health care is really going to be thought about. It's not, I don't think, going to continue to be in those acute care facilities. Facilities. Okay, I don't have to run down. You've probably read the rest of those old, new. This, again, not a big surprise to you. So um, this is something you've certainly seen. Um, this is a diagram, you know, that just looks really pretty. I know you can't read it at all. Um, 
but what's interesting about it again is that 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 individual and family in the center and the different types of health care um, now we are going to provide these slides to you I think on the website is that what we do put it on the website so you'll be able to actually read it but it says things like you know primary care social worker um, uh, hospice rehabilitation housing so it's it's all the different kinds of health care that revolve around um, the individual uh, not just hospitals, but all the different kinds. And then the practices that support that are in the, the circle on the far outside. So things like evidence-based uh, practice and individual patient and, um, engagement. So I actually do like the graphic for what it exemplifies in terms of really thinking about where um, we're going. And again, some of these things are focusing on value, coordinated around the individual, integrated into the communities. Okay, not just thought about in terms of health and healthcare being these, these geographic facilities that we go to, but rather that it's everything um, that we do. And this really lays the groundwork for what I'm gonna be talking about with um, population health management. So last but not least, kind of pulling this all together, you know, uh, the new map model, value-based care, I think takes into consideration a couple of things. Uh, value, certainly, and it is made up of both experience and cost, um, and lots and lots and lots of thinking about what is included in experience. So it's patient satisfaction, but not just the traditional way, you know, we measure that with our with our HCAP scores, right? It's also looking at um, what they're saying on Twitter. It might be looking at um, the rating that they give. You know, some hospitals and, and healthcare facilities are talking about an Amazon-like rating, you know, a five-point scale. How was your experience? Um, some people are actually in their, their clinics and things, and you might have seen this. I've, I've actually seen it even in bathrooms in airports. You know, when you're, you're leaving, it says, how was your experience? And it gives, have you seen that? They're like push buttons, you know? And I'm thinking, what a great thing. You know, give that immediate feedback. Um, one clinic that I visited um, actually gave every patient a chit. It was just a little wooden chit. And when they were walking out, there were two buckets. We did good, we did bad. And you put your chit in the one, and it was a clear box. So you could visually identify how things were going that day. And I thought, what a cool thing, you know. So I think we're going to see creativity on, on the part of what that experience all is about. And then certainly cost. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of tests well, you know, we continue to be orders of magnitude more expensive than anybody else in the world um, here in the United States. And that would be okay if we were actually top in quality. But yet again, in 2015, we were 33 in quality. Um, so there's 32 countries that do a better job than us, on at least the quality indicators that we have today. And, uh, you know, in some areas, you know, things like infant mortality in some of our big cities, you know, we rival third world countries. So we can't really sit here and, and sit on our laurels and say, yeah, we're expensive, but we're be the best, you know, because we're, we're not um, in many of the indicators. And so this is why we need to do something about healthcare in, in the country. So I think part of the answer is, is starting to think about how we approach population health management. I mentioned that I, I thought this could be our organizing uh, framework, and I'll explain that again why after I talk about these kind of, I call them quadrants, you know, I, I, I don't know, I haven't heard anybody else actually use that term, but you know, a quadrant is a column. So if we take the first column on the left-hand side, this is 40 to 60% of the population, and it's basically the healthy people that are at low risk, okay? So as we think about population health management for these folks, it's inexpensive, it's low touch, and all we're typically trying to do is encourage good, healthy behaviors. So good eating, um, good exercise, going to see the doctor, doing the preventive, um, or not preventive, the, excuse me, the screening things um, that you should be doing. Okay, so that's the majority of the population. And oftentimes, interestingly, as we've been talking about um, population health management, people immediately migrate to this percentage and they hand out Fitbits to all their employees. And they do a, a, a nice little website where you can look at all your benefits. And, and, and that is great because we wanna keep people over there. But I'll emphasize the word that this is five to 10% of our healthcare costs. Okay, and it's gonna get more and more as we go over to the right-hand side. So the next quadrant is this 20 to 25%, 
Um, the costs are going up on this particular one. It's, the engagement is a little bit of a, a lower touch, but here's the people who are getting elderly and could be developing type 2 diabetes because they're not eating correctly. So the adult onset diabetes. Um, they're overweight, and because they're overweight, they're at risk of developing hypertension. Um, these are the people that you know don't eat right, so it contributes to both of the things that I already talked about in terms of the uh, diabetes. So it's people at risk that we're trying to prevent them from moving to the right and developing a chronic condition, um, but they don't have that chronic condition yet. And this is often a really big focus area as we think about population health management. But again, it's still a relatively small percent of the population um, and a relatively small percent of the cost. But why we focus on these two groups is because we don't want them to move to the right. Okay? So if we get to this third quadrant, again, a small percent of the population, but these are, are, are uh, people with chronic disease. So they have active chronic disease. These are the diabetics that need to be monitored, the arthritics, the people with chronic pain because of um, uh, back problems, uh, the hypertensives. Um, this is, again, a more expensive, 30 to 40% of the, of the costs, requires more of a high touch. And um, what's interesting about this particular group is that here's where some of the tools that were going to be able to provide for self-management or self-monitoring might actually make a really big impact. Because again, with this group, what we're trying to prevent is going into that fourth quadrant, which is active disease, you know, where there is some complication actually occurring from the chronic disease, or um, maybe uh, it's an elderly person, and because they're, they're elderly, they have osteoporosis, and because of the osteoporosis, again, their, their bones are more brittle. So we're looking at activities like making sure they don't fall, because if, you know, an 85-year-old person um, falls, um, they're probably going to break something. Um, as compared to a 40-year-old who could fall in and probably bounce back. I was watching the news this morning, and there was, um, I think she was 20, she was 20-something, and she fell down a mountain skiing and tumbled over 1,000 feet, and nothing happened to her other than some bruises. <laughs> like, um, that, you know, obviously her bones were still very nice and pliable. Um, and it, again, you probably know what it increases with, with age, almost inevitably. Um, it's kind of like the eyesight thing, you know, 50% of the people by age 60 need reading glasses, and it's something like 90% by the time they reach 70. Um, some things, I guess, just have to happen. But interestingly, as we move into the active disease, again, um, you can see the costs go way up. And you can also see at the bottom, I identified, it's only 20% of the population approximately, but they consume 80% of the costs. So as we think about decreasing our costs, it's not just you know, the individual cost of a test, nor is it thinking about should that test be done or should that test not be done, but it's also thinking about the venue within which it's done. So keeping people out of the hospital and keeping them on that left-hand side, um, we all know that doing a, a hemoglobin hematocrit in an ambulatory setting in a clinic is going to be a bunch less expensive than if it's done in an acute care facility in a hospital. So what we're trying to do again with population health management is keep people as much as we can to the left, out of the acute care facility, prevent them from de um, developing chronic disease if at all possible, especially those where we, we can make a difference. Um, now, again, I, I completed this slide with some capability needs in terms of uh, the kinds of things you would think about related to IT support, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on some subsequent slides. I just thought this was a nice way of pulling it all together. And again, for me, this kind of is always home base. You know, this is that, that framework. Now, I mentioned this isn't just about measuring. It's not just about segmenting out the population and measuring which quadrant each individual is. It's about intervening. So the first way we think about intervening is with mobile. And um, I've been using these slides for a while, and um, I absolutely love this, so I'm going to continue to use it. Uh, you may not think it's as funny as I do. Um, this is a mobile computer, quote unquote mobile. Um, you can probably barely tell, but it telescopes out of the ceiling. And what makes it mobile is you could push it back up into the ceiling. Um, and so this was what we called mobile in the 90s. Some of you were there, I know. 
Uh, you know, this was the nurses in the recovery room insisted they couldn't have fixed devices as we started to roll out a documentation system there. And so we all sat around a conference room table and said, well, let's, you know, put these boat anchors, which is what the CRTs at that point were. You know, they weighed like 100 pounds. Um, but you can see the CPU, the, the monitor, and the keyboard there um, was quite heavy, so this thing was had to be bolted down to the ceiling. Um, let's just say it only took about an hour in real practice to identify that that didn't work. So plan B was to confiscate the respiratory therapy carts because of course we had no you know, real um, computers on wheels at that time. And this was um, our attempt at that. And again, you can see, see the CPU at the bottom of the cart and you see the keyboard and the, and the CRT. The blue uh, cabling going into the ceiling was because um, we didn't have batteries that lasted um, even a few hours. So that was power. And it was also a network cable because there was no wireless. Now, you know, I stand here today and it almost is hilarious to think, was there a time before wireless? You know, was there a time before laptops and flat screens? Um, some of you remember it, because I'm looking at hair colors and things out there. Um, it's, it's just interesting to think about how mobile has really changed. And the only thing I want to say is it has to continue to change, and we have to start to use the power of what we've got. And so looking at smart devices, and these happen to be iPhone 6s and, and Apple Watches, you know, it could be iPads, as I mentioned before. It certainly could be non-Apple, and it could be, you know, Samsung devices. Um, but the thinking about how we can use these tools to make a difference in the care that patients are delivering. And as you all, uh, not patients are delivering, patients are receiving, sorry. Um, as you all integrate the use of mobile into your personal lives, it's interesting to think about how healthcare is not only behind in EMR implementations and, and the use of computers in our everyday lives at work, but to think about how it hasn't really been integrated into uh, the way we, um, use our mobile devices either. So there's a great opportunity here. Um, these particular applications are those for visiting um, patients in their homes and for organizing the work if you're a nurse um, during a work day. So they're actually meant more for the provider. But in the patient engagement space, you can imagine you know, reminders for the different kinds of foods, ability to take pictures of things, ability to measure things using the device. So really pulling in the internet of things and the abilities to use some of the other devices that can integrate with our, our smart devices. Um, I was curious, the other day somebody was talking about doing an ultrasound uh, with a snap-on device onto their mobile phone. And I was like, well, that's really interesting. I mean, you could do the ultrasound, but then who's going to interpret it? But then I thought, well, yeah, okay, you could do it, and then, you know, like send it to the doc for interpretation. So I looked it up, and you know how much that co the device costs to do an ultrasound on your mobile phone? $199. I mean, it almost seems unbelievable. And so I think, again, our mobile devices coupled with devices um, from thinking about the, the whole ecosystem and, and the Internet of Things are really going to be powerful as we start to think about um, empowering uh, patients and, and patient engagement. So mobile specifically is really being um, exploited to think about the anytime, ac ac anytime anywhere access to data to develop new engagement techniques and health strategies with patients, a way to drive information to them, and then certainly to gain insights to provide more personalized and proactive interventions. In other words, actually taking analytics and driving it to the point of care for that, that personalized device. So the next thing I'm going to do here is, is run a video and a big thanks, big shout out to Kaiser Permanente. You know, um, they do, uh, some of you I'm sure are from Kaiser since we're in California. Um, you know, this particular video is out on YouTube and I, I really like, they have a series of them. I think there's six of them. I'm just showing one about the power of mobile and the art of the possible as we start to think about um, where you could be going in the future.
So when we think about this, this power of patient engagement and population health management, um, it's the idea of, of knowing each individual, understanding how to engage them, and, and how to empower them. And it's this personalization that I think is going to make the difference and be what we're really talking about, making the difference with that mobile device. Because you can drive things very specific to that individual. Um, you've all noticed, I am sure, I call it the creep factor, but you know, when you're doing Google searches or you go into your Gmail, if you have Gmail or some more of a common mail thing, where it pulls up ads that are tailor-made to you, um, you know, like, I maybe browsed something two days ago or maybe I purchased something and something similar to that comes up in, in the ads. That's the kind of thing that, that I'm talking about here where we're actually going to personalize the experience related to, to healthcare as compared to shopping. So some of the trends in terms of um, really supporting why is this getting to be something that patients are more willing to think about doing. Well, again, the way we pay for and deliver care is changing, and specifically um, the increased burden, if you will, that's, that's on the, the individual. Statistics here, by the way, seem to be around 20% of our um, costs of what we spend our money on is health care um, in the United States. So, you know, for every four things we buy elsewhere, we're buying something in health care. Um, it sounded high to me, but I saw that, that statistic validated, and so I'm, I'm thinking that's pretty close to, to where we're at. Um, that would include dental, but, but still. Um, health IT adoption, um, the good news, has, has reached a tipping point, so we can certainly look at the use of technology and, and smartphones and other kinds of devices. Um, technology is certainly getting better, cheaper, faster, and more ubiquitous so that more people have it. And then consumers are actually increasingly expecting online engagement. And most often what you see and hear that about is um, appointments. You know, people want to be able to make appointments online, cancel appointments, and change them. Um, and so we're just starting to kind of get into that, you know, make the reservation for your hotel, make your reservation for your, your flight, oh, and make your reservation to have your, your health care experience. I find myself, if I can't do online appointments, uh, that actually weighs into the physician that I, that I pick or the dentist that I pick. Okay, we've got one more um, video here, and this is an interesting one. Um, as we start to think about integrating everything in our lives and health and healthcare rotating around the individual instead of around the healthcare organizations, there's some interesting things that come up. Now, I'm probably going to launch this, and it won't. I'll just let you do it. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. Is this Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Corp, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well... I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could save $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? <laughs> oh. But I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Man, I'd say tofu and sprouts is, like, required. That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's $19.99 even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Want to stop this from happening? 
<laughs> so what's driving consumerism in healthcare? Let's kind of move on to, to this particular topic. Um, as we think about becoming more of the consumers of healthcare, than just the receivers of healthcare. And what I mean by that, again, is thinking of those sort of retail kinds of, of behaviors um, that we start to exhibit when we're paying for things as compared to when it was free through the insurance that was completely covered by your employers. Um, so we got this cost shifting, right? Out-of-pocket uh, costs are increasing for individual consumers and an uh, increase in the use of high deductible plans. Um, statistic I heard on this was in the 40s, like 45, 47% of us have high deductible plans now. Um, and I think it's because of the cost, right? The high deductible plans are typically a lot less expensive um, than what might be considered to be more of a traditional plan. Um, this is gonna play itself out kind of in an interesting way though, because one of the things that we in the United States continue to really Really want to do is, is choice, right? We, we resist anything where we don't have choice. And so when um, somebody comes to us and, and they said, well, you can, you can have health care, but you have to just use these preferred providers, we're like, I want to be able to go to whoever I want to be able to go to. And it, it continues to be something that's kind of at, at balance because typically the less expensive plans are the ones where they have contracts with individual um, specific providers. Um, and that's true in, in the dental as well. Um, and so, again, these star ratings or this idea of the satisfaction component becomes particularly important. Um, how many of you feel like over the last two years, the way you're getting health care and the way you're treated when you get it, uh, and include dental in there, it has been changing. You're being seen more as a consumer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're paying more attention um, to the, the, not just the creature comforts, but making it easier for you. You know, again, it could be the making of appointments. It could be following up on what you're supposed to do. They're printing out your instructions more. Um, you know, even simple things like being able to send the, the prescriptions and get refills online and order medications online and those kind, the kinds of things. Um, so the left-hand side are just some statistics in terms of some of the things that are really going on in terms of, of uh, the, the cost of what's going on and why we are all paying so much attention um, to this. The other thing that's starting to happen, and it's um, upping the ante for traditional health care, and that is these um, alternate ways or new business models. Um, and what's interesting about this is it started with the quick cares. That's the one, of course, I talked about earlier. You know, it, whether it's uh, Walgreens or whether it's, you know, uh, CVS or some of the other healthcare clinics, um, we're seeing increasing other ways that this is happening, partnerships. So I think CVS is up to partnering with six different healthcare, large healthcare organizations. Walgreens got, has a couple of those. Um, Walmart is moving out of just the quick cares and they're actually opening primary care clinics. And what they're doing in those primary care clinics is providing care for the individuals who work at Walmart, and they've been so successful with that on-site, you know, where the employer takes on the risk, there's not an, an intermediary third party, that they're starting to say they're gonna offer that to other employers, where they will be the primary care clinic and the provider for an employer. Okay, so this idea of the traditional employer buys insurance, employee buys insurance, and we got this middleman is beginning to change. Whether we're going to see that, you know, rampantly happen, I don't know. But again, because there's a recruitment and retention component here, because we all have, you know, it's kind of funny to think back, you know, 20 years ago, nobody talked about open enrollment. You didn't change insurance, right? Because you had the best insurance. This idea of open enrollment and people switching every year um, is an interesting idea, and it's what's causing some of us to really look at our benefits and say, well, these guys are offering more than these guys, and if I have this done, you know, I can go here, and I want to go there, and so, and so more of a commodity and really starting to think about this again as more of a retail experience. I actually think it's all healthy because when we do that, again, we're gonna to start to become more engaged. You know, when I pay for it, I, I own it more than when I don't. And so the ramifications that that has for our health and doing the healthy behaviors, um, I think is, is pretty good. So again, these new business models and these new partnerships and relationships and a different way of thinking about healthcare is definitely um, around the corner. 
Um, now, today, you can, there's a lot of different ways that you can get more engaged in your care and have the cost transparency and things. I would have to say that probably the, um, the industry that's doing the best with that is the insurer or the payer industry. Um, the Anthems, the Aetna's, the United's, um, they're doing a really good job with applications and, you know, whether it's an iPad or a phone application where you can say, well, I need this colonoscopy, where can I go? And making it easy for you to manage through the system and, and figure that out. So on that, I've got another little video. <laughs> My assistant will be up shortly um, to launch the video. Hello, I'm Julia Norris, and I live in New York with my husband and our daughter. While I'm away on business, I receive a call from my daughter's teacher, who notices that she is having trouble catching her breath at recess, and suggested a doctor visit. Right from my tablet, I will book an appointment for my daughter using my health plan engagement app. After logging in securely, my personalized dashboard gives me direct access to my primary health care network. Here, I can easily view my GP's details. If necessary, I can use the map to find physicians in my family's area. I can also use the advanced search feature to find urgent care locations by entering keywords or by clicking Find Me, which brings up nearby doctors. Finding a doctor, I can now seek advice and book an appointment with their office through video or text chat with an assistant by easily relaying my health insurance information using the digital ID cards. which I can swipe through in full screen mode. I receive a confirmation of the appointment in my inbox, as well as messages when my doctor provides a prescription for my daughter. From my prescription center, I can manage all of my family's medications, find out more information, and locate pharmacies. Reassured about my daughter's health, I use My Healthy Life to check my own current health status in relation to my community, my family, and my friends. This health plan engagement app has transformed the way I engage with our healthcare providers. I have the peace of mind of being able to take care of my family's health from wherever I am. Interesting, huh? When you think about, again, all the integration and the ability to do things that we actually do in other aspects of our lives, but don't traditionally do for all of our um, health care needs. The, the booking of the appointments, the sending of information, using a map to see where there's close by um, practitioners and things. So, you know, really exciting, I think, times. And we're going to see a big proliferation of these kinds of things over the next few years. So let's, let's go away from the mobile, the patient engagement, the consumerism, and start to think a little bit about analytics. Here's another one of my uh, dense graphics. Um, but I, I like this one because it talks about the different ways we often think about analytics. And again, it's not just necessarily in the narrow area of population health, because there's other components that are going to factor into this. So these are the four big categories, population health, how are we doing with provider relations? How are we doing with risk man management? And how are we doing with consumer engagement? So those are some of the areas where we'd be thinking about using analytics to receive or um, get intel on the different areas. And again, some, some sample analytic applications across the bottom, risk stratification, care paths, network optimization, utilization prediction, you know, cost pattern detection, et cetera. You know, I think you can read those, so I probably don't need to read them to you. Um, so what's interesting about all this is that we've all had electronic, most of us, have had electronic health records now for a while. And we've all had um, uh, payment systems and financial um, reporting that we've been able to collect all of this information. And the idea now is how do we take all that information and actually turn it into insights? So it's not just data but we're actually using it to inform ourselves. And you know, we're at a critical point, I think, in healthcare um, where lots of people are starting to think and to talk about this. And our, 
am I doing my analytics within my electronic health record and pulling in, if I don't have a financial system in there, pulling in the financial data and doing it in the EHR? Am I exporting it out of the EHR into a third party analytics database and manipulating it there where I'm pulling in the financial and other information? Um, I think we see lots of different ways that, that people are doing the analytics. And I think it's too early to know exactly that there is a best way. Um, I think it all depends on what you do with the data and how flexible it actually is. Um, in almost all cases, though, even when you're doing it, quote unquote, within the EHR, you're not doing it actually in your online real-time system. You're using, you know, the um, shadow copy, if you will, or the, the replicated copy for, for the analytics. Um, but that is the kind of data that we're talking about, diving quite deep on exactly what's going on with the, the individual's care. And this, of course, would require you to have not just the acute care information, but also the ambulatory care information, the home care information, et cetera. And this has been the struggle for our early pioneer ACOs, right, is to actually pull all this data together. Um, I don't even want to bring up this word, but I have to. Interoperability, um, you know, has been a challenge uh, when I was at the federal government. I've only been at IBM for a year. So um, I was at the federal government for three years and um, lived and breathed and, and smelled interoperability. It was at the time that we were doing really well um, with stage one and really doing decent with stage two. We were just beginning to publish the, the um, drafts on stage three. And of course, everybody in Congress was disappointed because somehow they magically thought that when you put in an electronic health record that it automatically was connected to all the other electronic health records in the world. And those of you in this room, none of you are surprised, right, <laughs> that that wasn't the case. Um, and so unfortunately, that, that caused a lot of dissatisfaction on the Hill in terms of what they think they got for the money that they spent. Um, you know, I think most of us are here to say, you know, we got a lot. You know, we took our um, penetration of electronic health records in our ambulatory and um, acute care facilities, you know, from small numbers to super big numbers. And, you know, that was, you know, very much of a success. But when we start to think about some of these other kinds of things, we did not make a lot of strides with interoperability. And that is going to be the challenge this year and next year and the year after next couple of years is to really figure that out and to make data a commodity too so that we can you know share the data and what's the model going to be is going to be interesting you know we've got different things going on in different states different regions um, some healthcare organizations, of course, kind of own the healthcare in their area, so that makes it easy because they're all on one system. But that's not the case in most um, geographies. Certainly, that's not the case in your geography here. So, how do we make sure that we can um, get that information, liquid, liquidize the data, as we used to um, always say? Um, is it going to be a database in the sky that everybody contributes to versus going and getting when you need it or transmitting it through CCDAs and um, using direct or not using direct? You know, these are the things that still have to get, get vetted out. And we are not going to have good analytics for overall health and health care, the kind that we know we need, until we figure that problem out. And so I'll take a pause, of course, on this analytics slide to say your analytics are only as good as the data that you've got. Um, and it's easy if you're only worrying about what's going on within your own organization. But unfortunately, many, 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 many patients don't go all within the same organization. Um, I know when I was at the government, we used to think, well, VA and DOD, you know, those are easy. And then I found out that 43% of the care for vets happens at a non-VA facility, 43%. So they have as much of a need for this interoperability as, as anybody else. Um, and that's, by the way, because of the location. Um, they have a bunch of contracts with, with private care facilities to do the, the vet's care. Um, and that could be everything from OB of, of um, uh, our, our service folks as well as their, their families and also just procedures and things that they don't do in the VA hospitals. Um, and so anyway, we have continue to have that issue. Um, Putting that issue aside for the moment, um, I think this analytics journey is, again, a base that we really need for population health. Because going back to that graphic with my four quadrants, you can't do that without having the data. You won't even be able to segment out your population. Um, now, the interesting thing with this is um, the, the, the patient's ownership. 
you know, when we talk about percentages of things, you know, like what percent of, of the women who are within the ages of, I'm going to make all this up, between the ages of, of 40 and 70 are getting mammograms because mammogram rates should be 85 percent. How can you do that unless you know that you're managing all of your patients? And of course, again, I'll use Kaiser as the example. In a Kaiser uh, setting, you are assigned a primary. <laughs> I was Kaiser while I was at the government. That's the only um, time I was, I was able to actually have that as an option. And it was funny because um, I started uh, in October and I signed up for Kaiser, and within weeks, I get the email saying you have to pick a primary care doctor. And I was busy, I had a new job, I had just moved, you know, I ignored the email, like we ignore a lot of our emails. And um, then two weeks later, or maybe it was a month, I got another one, you, you know, you gotta, and I ignored that one too. And then the third one came and it said, um, if you don't pick a primary care doctor, we will pick one for you. And I'm like, okay, I'm motivated. I'll get on the website, and I, I picked a doctor, and once I picked that doctor, within a week, I got the email saying, here's the things that your age, your sex, these are the kinds of things that you should be doing, and here's the, the tests that you should have. If you've already had those tests, I just need to get those results. Now, what was happening with that is I was in that doctor's denominator, and the incentives for that individual physician probably were things like mammogram rates and hypertension under control and hemoglobin A1Cs for diabetics, right? And so once you get in the denominator, then you can be managed. But if you're not in the denominator, if nobody even knows you're out there, if you belong to Aetna and you never selected a primary care physician, who's intervening for you? Who's, you know, who are you working with? What denominator are you actually in? Um, you could be in the denominator of own, being in that plan, but there's, there's no way they can hold an individual physician accountable for your mammogram rate. Okay, you get the gist of what I'm saying. So this, this analytics ends up, again, not just being population health management, but it ends up the quality of the data is gonna drive what you're able to do with it. And so I emphasize this so greatly, it isn't just about measurement. It's about how this measurement is being done in the context of the way the care is actually being delivered. So the analytics journey itself is, in fact, a journey for all organizations. Uh, starting on the left-hand side, going to the right-hand side, very few are at the cognitive level. You know, that's where, again, it's not a programmed um, uh, analytics. It's a, a, we'll talk about that, a cognitive analytics. That's the Watson kind. But as we think about starting with basic reporting and moving our way through foundational analytics and into predictive and prescriptive. Now, even basic reporting can be helpful, you know, because you need to know numbers, you need to know counts, you need to know, you know, what you've got, what you're even dealing with. Um, and then as you start to get into foundational, you can think of things like, um, you know, of all the patients who are um, discharged from my facility, which ones are readmitted and what diagnoses are they? Um, and then you can start to drill down, even in foundational, right, and say, well, of the ones who are readmitted, if 50% of them are diabetics, well, what diagnosis did they have while they were in the hospital? So you can start to actually analyze and understand your readmission rates, right? Because what you want to be doing, of course, is getting into the intervention part of that again. So as we go into the predictive and prescriptive, that's where you start to say, based on what I know about the past, I can analyze the data and predict what's going to be happening in the future. And this becomes particularly important, again, in population health management because you're going to want to be taking that information and turning it into intelligence that's going to be used in the care of the patients. So if I fall into that category of that diabetic who had those specific diagnoses, who is probably more at risk of readmission than anybody else, I want to know that and I want to be able to intervene while the person is still in the hospital. Okay, and it could be an age range, it could be diagnosis, it could be coexisting conditions. These are the kinds of things that we're analyzing for so we can create this predictive and, and prescriptive. And we'll talk about cognitive, I'll leave that out there for, for now because it's so different, but I've got a, a few slides on that um, coming up. Now the other important thing about analytics is that it really does need to span both knowledge and data. Knowledge being what we know uh, as best practice, what's been published, what's been done in research, what is the evidence-based practice? Because we wanna be comparing our data 
to that. And on the right-hand side is the data itself, where we're actually able to look at individual insights for individual patients as compared to looking at patients related to population averages on the left-hand side. So personalized medicine comes in on the right-hand side. We start to pull in things like genomics, and again, we're very early on that um, uh, development stage here. But thinking about, again, this whole idea on a continuum, we have to have a platform, we have to have dashboards. You know, this was one of the um, very important, if you're going to track and, and monitor, getting to that concurrent part. You know, doing it retrospectively will help you understand in general what you're doing, but it's not going to help you actually intervene. So we want to have those, those dashboards which can pre, um, actually give the, the concurrent information. Okay, so when we start to talk about um, cognitive, um, that's Watson. And what's different about Watson is it's really the third era of computing. So we had the tabulating systems era, we had the program era, and now we have the cognitive era. And we're just really getting into to cognitive. What we all know about cognitive is when we watched, you know, Watson do Jeopardy in, in 2011. But I'll talk about that a little bit more. Just stepping back to program, just to remind you, you know, program if, then, else, you have to account for every condition. You're telling the computer what to do under certain circumstances. And that's what's dramatically different as we move into cognitive. You are training the computer with information, but you're not giving it all of the conditions. You're training it um, what knowledge base to use, and it applies its own logic to draw a conclusion, and when it gives you that conclusion, it will give you the probability of it being correct. Okay? Um, so a little bit more about that. What's so exciting about cognitive? Um, you are not again, programming every condition with if-then-else kinds, kinds of things. So that it learns and it reasons. Now, it doesn't magically learn, okay? It has to be trained. And so in the case of Jeopardy, I'll use that as the example. How was it trained? Well, it was trained with all the previous Jeopardy ep episodes. It ingested dictionaries. It ingested encyclopedias, okay? And that was how it had the information that it was able to respond to the questions correctly. Not because it magically used some intelligence, you know, that it, that it had. We shy away from using the term artificial intelligence. It has kind of a negative connotation to it. Um, because again, especially in healthcare, we're providing recommendations with a percent probability, okay? We're not giving, you know, the, the answer in an intelligent way. We're providing information that can be used. The second thing that's so interesting is that it can interact naturally. And what it means by that is it uses natural language processing. So natural language processing, in the case of when it played Jeopardy, it could actually hear the words and understand what they meant. In the case of ingesting um, you know, uh, encyclopedias and ingesting articles that are being published, and that's one of the things we talk about in healthcare, there's way too much information for any one person to read all the articles, right? We're doubling our knowledge every two years right now, um, and it's predicted to just keep going up and up and up. And so some um, helper, and, and Watson can be that helper, has to look through those articles and tell us what might be significant from the research for individual groups of patients or for individual patients. And so using natural language processing, it can read through the articles. Okay, it actually reads through the articles. And um, ingests them and takes it in as knowledge. So that's the interact naturally. Um, and by the way, then it, of course, can, can talk back. It can also give reports back. Um, so it uses the learning and reasoning and this interaction to actually discover and, and decide. Um, those of you who are interested in this, there's a gazillion videos out on um, YouTube that you can look at in terms of different ways that it's actually um, being used. The most um, famous one right now in healthcare is, is um, Oncology Advisor. And how Oncology Advisor works is, again, it ingested a lot of um, published literature related to oncology. But in this particular case, it was Memorial Sloan Kettering and the physicians there that are the curators of the knowledge, okay? So they're the ones that have given the guidelines and are responsible for the training. Um, and they will throw out certain types of articles and they will um, say, no, that doesn't apply here because that study was done in this place and we're very different. So they, it is actually curated information and the best practice care is provided 
from the physicians the way they would practice at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, so it's unique to that, and if you happen to be at MD Anderson, for example, they would probably not be using Oncology Advisor because their practices there are probably a bit different than what would be done if you were at Memorial Sloan Kettering. However, when you think about all the places that don't have an MD Anderson or a Memorial Sloan Kettering in their geography or anywhere near their geography, um, this can be a real help. And again, what it does is it looks at the research how it relates to an individual and that individual's patient data, and it makes recommendations for course of therapy. And it usually gives more than one recommendation with the percent probability of it being successful, okay? And so you might be able to, well, you do. That what they do is they use this with the patient. The physician sits down with the patient with this as a piece of information. Okay, so we have our last video, and of course it's about Watson, um, healthcare specific, and uh, this one's a little longer, so I may not let the whole thing run. Watson can do so much more than win Jeopardy these days. What specifically can Watson Health do that, for example, a United Health or a Mayo Clinic can't do? Well, I think one of the, the key things, Emily, is that we spent the last year really working on the knowledge side of medicine with Watson, understanding all the unstructured tech, the research material. And now what we're doing with the new Watson Health Cloud is bringing together all the structured information, the, the data that comes from the devices that we carry around, the consumer devices, the medical devices. As we start to pull that data together, the amount of information that we as humans are going to collect through our lifetime is reaching to the point where it's equivalent to uh, 1,100 terabytes of data or about 300 million books about each and every one of us. This is an enormous amount of information and requires really serious horsepower to be able to deal with and Watson's going to provide that. We're going to deal not just with the knowledge of medicine, the knowledge of research, we're also going to deal with the big data around all of our individual health, bringing those together in a new cloud environment. So give me some examples. What could Watson Health conceivably do for me as a patient? Well, for example, if you're uh, using your Apple device, all right, you might uh, be collecting your information about your health in HealthKit. Uh, you'll have the option to share that information in HealthKit with your doctor so they can actually keep track of the information about you, about your care. So, for example, you have your blood pressure checked on an infrequent basis by your doctor, but what if it was being checked all the time and you were a patient that was taking medications for blood pressure? That would be a real-time system now with real-world evidence to help your doctor provide better care for you. What about privacy? How do you protect individual privacy? That privacy is a great point. One of the key things about uh, the Watson Health Cloud is we have the ability to anonymize the information in a secure way. It's a secure HIPAA compliant environment that will enable us to, to store that information in a safe way that makes it available for researchers. In addition to being able to share your information from your devices with, uh, with your doctor, you'll have the choice to share it via research kit. Uh, for researchers around the world. And I think today's uh, new generation really likes this idea of sharing for the greater good and being able to share your health information with, uh, with researchers is a way to do that as long as it's anonymized. And that's really what this is all about. Now, the gathering of this information takes time. These big data initiatives take time. How long till we see actionable results from something like this? Well, one of the important things about yesterday's announcement was uh, the acquisitions of Explorus and Fitel. Between the two of them, we have uh, data access to over 90 million lives. So we're starting off from a pretty big... This is where it sort of gets into an IBM advertisement, so we don't need that. But what's, what's interesting, and I do believe, by the way, we will be seeing additional examples of cognitive computing. Watson, of course, is the one who has the most name recognition right now, um, but we are going to see, I think, other ones uh, beginning to proliferate in the marketplace. So again, this is really an interesting concept. I think he did a pretty good job of describing the fact that, um, you know, it's research data coupled with individual uh, patient data and or groups of data to actually draw conclusions as to what makes sense for this individual. And the second thing that he talked about that was so important is this ability, again, through device integration to start pulling in. You know, I talked about the ultrasound thing, but there's all sorts of devices that can can get connected to our mobile phones and collect information. Everything from fetal heartbeat, um, yes, there are devices you can buy. Again, Internet of Things is going crazy. Um, hook into your mobile phone that will actually transmit fetal heartbeat if you're um, a pregnant mom. You know, right on through some of the things we saw in the video with temperature and, and, and pulse monitoring and blood pressure monitoring, um, et cetera. So again, a really interesting area as we start to talk about moving the responsibility 
for health and health care, not just with our health care organizations, but out to our individuals. And that is going to make a difference in population health management. So with that, I'm finally done. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Should we do some questions? Questions? <laughs>